Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Uh, three, four people. This is fantastic. It's good to be in church. Amen. Yes, it's summer. I know there are a few of us, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to have a good time and experience God and worship and community together on Sabbath morning. I do have a few quick announcements and then I'll turn it over to these uh, really good looking young people uh, for some more official things. But I do have to know you, uh, let you know a few quick things. First, uh, day camp started this last week. Uh, it went really well, right, Caleb? Was it crazy? It was, it was crazy. There were so many kids. So there's a lot of kids, which is a good problem, uh, but Pastor Alex has, wants everyone to know that they are in need, Caleb, you probably can testify to this of more drivers and people to help with food. So if you are at all interested and willing and able to do that, please contact uh, Pastor Alex via email or the church office. The other thing everyone needs to know is uh, Pastor Monty Torkelson will be here June 23. That is his first Sabbath and he'll actually be preaching that Sabbath. And we're gonna have a welcome uh, lunch for him. So everyone needs to know that there's going to be a big, like, welcome potluck lunch for Pastor uh, Monty Torkelson uh, and his wife, Darla, and that is on June 23. And then finally, uh, Jeremy Winston, who has just joined us not too long ago, uh, his choir is pretty, they're pretty legit. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, uh, but they actually have sung at the White House uh, multiple times, and just this last year, they are the World Choir, I didn't even know this existed, to be honest, but there's this thing called the World Choir Games, and they're gold medal champions of this. So the Jeremy Winston Chorale, they are doing a concert here June 30 at 8 o'clock uh, that, honestly, I think is going to be pretty amazing. So that is what you need to know uh, as we get going here in church. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, uh, I just wanted to say happy to be here again, back after college. So my name is Caleb Chavez. I've been a member here for six years, and I'm a college student at Uni Nebraska. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to Ariana now. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ariana Moretta, and I've been a member here my whole life. Um, today's sermon topic is on judgment. And we know that everybody has a lot of different opinions about a lot of different things. Everybody has different beliefs. But just because they do is no reason for us to judge each other. So today's question for you guys to ask each other is, who were you rooting for in the NBA Finals? And if you weren't rooting for anyone, just make sure to greet someone near you. children's story and we're not going to collect the offering now we're going to collect offering on the way back up hi guys good morning good morning i like your matching dress I need you to sit, okay? 
Okay. Well, good morning, boys and girls. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret about me. I am forgetful. Sometimes I forget things. So sometimes I go to the grocery store and I'm supposed to get peanut butter and bread. And I come home with three loaves of bread and no peanut butter. Sometimes somebody leaves on sale, Emmerich comes to my house and leaves something at my house and I say, oh, I'll bring it to church on Sabbath. So I put it in my car. I remember to put it in my car, but then I forget to take it out. And so it sits in my car for three weeks. Sometimes I do something that I don't like and I bite my fingernails. And I have to remind myself, no, Jesse, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. So sometimes I'm forgetful. So I have to do things to remind myself to make sure I don't forget things. Do you guys ever forget anything? I do. Sometimes I do. You do? And what do you do to help you remember? Um, Sit down. Mommy, I bite my hand. You use your brain. And I think about what I should get mommy. and sometimes mommy, I just forget. Mommy, mommy, mommy. I mommy. forget about what the same thing So Olivia uses her brain to help her remember things. Emmerich, how do you remember things? Sometimes when I go to school, before I go to school, and after breakfast, I forget my Friday girl or my Easter bunny or a blanket. So sometimes Emmerich, when he goes to school, he forgets his things. How do you remember things? Throw the pillow out the door. Well, you throw something out the door? The pillow at the door. Okay, so we all have different ways of remembering. So I'm going to tell you some of the things that help me remember. I remember... I have to okay, Callan, what do you do to, rem to help remember things? Sometimes I forget where I put my toys, and I just... To help me remember, I just find my binoculars. And then oh, he uses the binoculars to help him find. Okay, so these are the clues that I do. Please sit down. In, 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 in our these are the things that I do to help me to remember. I write things down. So when I go to the grocery store, can somebody help me read? Can you read what's on my finger? PB. PB. So this reminds me to get peanut butter so I don't come out with four loaves of bread and no peanut butter. And when I'm afraid to bite my fingernails, when I'm going to bite my nail, I see this rubber band on my wrist and I go like that. And it reminds me, don't bite your fingernails. We all have ways that we remember. Sometimes we write things down on our finger or other things. Now, the Bible tells us about people called the Gentiles who remembered something in a special way. It says that they had the law of God. They knew about God's law and God's love in their hearts, which means they didn't have it written down on their finger or on a piece of paper or a note on their phone. They remembered it in their hearts. That's how they knew what the law was. And Jesus talked about this earlier in the Bible in the Old Testament, where he said to the Israelites to keep the law. We talk about it at our dinner tables. We write it on our hands and we hold it in our hearts. So I want to remind you to keep Jesus' love and Jesus' directions for our life close to us, not written on our finger or on a rubber band on our wrist, but close in our hearts. And to help you do that, we've made these little things with a heart on them. And I want you to help this to remind you to keep God's love and God's law in your heart. So you can put this on your backpack or around your wrist or on your water bottle, and this will help remind you to keep Jesus' love and Jesus' directions in your heart. Okay, you can get one of these, and then boys and girls, I want you to collect the offering for a worthy student fund and then bring it to the back. You want a different one? My name is Don Shaw, and I was born here. I'm Ted Shaw. My name is Don Shaw, and I was born here. I'm Ted Shaw. I've been a member of this church for almost all of my life. My first teacher here was Sally Wald, which obviously I don't remember that much, except for the fact that. As I grew I and stuff, um, she the first time that we is one that I now call Aunt Sally. I remember the first time that we brought my son, and who's my oldest, into the Sabbath school. And having had that personal relationship of, of with Sally for more than just the time that I was here in Sabbath school, her reaction was fantastic. And it, it just made that day so much better. 
and she brought him up and did the little thing in the rocking cradle and, and all that and moving on from there we'd do the the leaves that go round and round and fall to the ground and the kids always love that play that that's just fun and i believe that it impacts them and just as part of their overall growing and becoming young men and, and ladies. So, I would strongly encourage people to become involved with, with helping in Sabbath School. It's a way that you can, first of all, give back to the church. It's also makes your spiritual life grow. We're in a big church, and when you get involved, it, it helps shrink the size of the church because you get to know people one-on-one -on -one better and the it, it helps create that sense of community. And you don't have to be the main teacher of the, the class. You can be the helper that gets all the stuff. You can teach at one of the small tables. You can do all kinds of things. And it does make you grow because as you're planning and preparing to teach, it makes you learn and think about it in a different way. It, it's, it's, it's not what you're really giving to them, well it is, but it's also what you're getting back. Sabbath, hope you all are doing well on this beautiful Sabbath morning. It's awesome out there. Let's sing together a little bit, Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song And sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of my redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, here by thy great help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Hunting from thy father's God He to rescue me from danger Interposed his precious blood Oh, by grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let that goodness like a feather By my wandering heart to thee From to wonder, Lord, I feel it From to leave the God I love Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above Greater is the one Who's in us Greater is the one who calls our name, he will never fail. Stronger is the one within us. Stronger is the one who fights for us. He will never fail. You will never fail. For your love endures forever oh your love endures forever open up our eyes surround us with your light your love endures forever mighty 
is the one. Mighty is the one who's for us. Mighty is the one who's strong to save. He will make a way. You will make a way for your love endures forever. All oh, your love endures forever. Open up our eyes, surround us with your light. Your love endures forever. Our God is fighting for us always. Our God is fighting for us all. Our God is fighting for us always. We are not alone. We are not alone. For your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Open up our eyes. Surround us with your light. Your love endures forever. Our God is fighting for us always. Our God is fighting for us all. Our God is fighting for us always. We are not alone. We are not alone. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Last week, uh, Perichoresis, which is the high school ministry of our church, along with Donnie Scholl, uh, we took 31 students to Cedar Point. Have you been there? 
You have not been there. There's this thing called the dragster. Have you heard of it? Uh, and I could sit here and describe it all day long, but it's one of those things that I could tell you about and describe, but it just would not do it justice. It's just something that you have to experience. And then Donnie Shaw, along with his wife, Greta, we took a group of, uh, how many did we take? About 20 some, uh, 20 people uh, this last week to Chicago. And, uh, and we went to this place called Wrigley Field. Have you been there? Yeah, I don't know how we happened to go there. Whatever, coincidence. Uh, right? And we went to the top of Sears Tower. Have you done that? And I can describe all of these things for days, but it wouldn't do it justice. It's one of those things that you just have to experience. And isn't that what church is like? We can sit and we, we, we talk to each other, we teach each other, we describe things, and that's really, really good. But ultimately, church and worship and this time together, it's an experience, something that we do together in community on Sabbath morning. So right now uh, is our time for a community prayer. I want to invite you down if you have uh, any, anything heavy on your heart, uh, a praise, uh, something that you just want to give thanks for, you're invited to, to come down now. Um, or if there's something specific or intentional that you really want to lift to God, you're invited to come uh, right now as we do this together. Um, I do have to announce as you're making your way down. Uh, that yesterday, it's with heavy heart that as a church, uh, Stella Freeman and Roger Randolph, longtime members here of our church, uh, they lost their brother Ken Randolph yesterday. Uh, so I want to keep want to tell you that to keep them in your prayers. And if you want more information about the services, you can contact the church office here this next week. Um, but yeah, an, an experience. As as Donnie and I and, and Greta, we took these 20 kids to Chicago this last week, and, and the kids, they were talking to each other on the way back in the vans, and uh, as kids do, and you know, they were describing, oh, this is a great trip, and they love they loved the city, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but someone in the van said to another, uh, to the other kids that said, the trip was great, but what made the trip better was the van. And I know, as great as the Kettering College van is, so uh, thank you, Kettering College, for letting us borrow the van. It's not the van that they were talking about, but it was community. It was being together and ex having those experiences together that made it better. And isn't that what church and community prayer is all about, is living and experiencing God together just makes a difference. Uh, so uh, will you bow your heads with me as we pray together as a church? Uh, Father, we come to you as a, as a community, as a church family, and we just thank you so much for all of the good things that you give us, the ways that you provide in our lives. How many times right now, if we just stop and pause and think about how many times have we cried out to you? for school help or relational help or professional help, and you've been there, you've answered. And so we thank you for that. All right, now, Father, we come to you again, crying out. Some of us with, with personal physical pain, we pray your, your, your power to heal in those situations. Some of us with more of a, an emotional pain, we pray that you show up in a mighty way. Uh, maybe some of us with spiritual pain. Maybe for some of us, there are family members, like right now, there are faces of our children or grandchildren or siblings that come to our head, and we just desperately want you to touch them wherever they are. And so we give them to you. But God, for those who are here standing and everyone in this space, we all have our own stories and our own narratives, and we all need you in our own ways. So God, I just beg that you show up and you touch all of our lives the way that only you can, that you lead and you guide and you bless in mighty ways. And Father, again, we thank you for Pastor Carl, his uh, leadership and his sermons. And as he uh, again brings us the word, I pray that you bless him abundantly, that you speak more powerfully through him perhaps than you've ever have spoken through him before so that we can leave this place more on fire and, and closer to you. And thank you for all that you do for us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Charles Spurgeon, a fiery preacher of yesteryear, once said, if we do not preach the coming judgment and wrath of God, we do not preach the gospel at all. 
He says, that, that would be like a surgeon who didn't want to tell his patient that she is ill. He hopes to heal her without her knowing that she was ever sick. So he flatters her that all is well. And naturally, the woman refuses his cure. Such a doctor, says Spurgeon, would be a murderer, not a healer. He goes on, and so are we. If we do not warn people about God's wrath and his impartial certain judgment of our every secret, and then paint them to the good news that Christ offers forgiveness for repentant sinners as their only hope. Well, nobody can accuse us around here of never preaching the wrath or the judgment of God. Two weeks ago, we looked at the wrath of God. Last week, we looked at the judgment of God as we are continuing our series through the book of Romans. And Pastor Jason just told me a few moments ago, he said, you know, your name and your sermons came up in the van on our road trip here to Chicago recently. And the word the kids use to describe your sermons, fire, fire, which I think is a good thing. But we preach fire and judgment and the wrath of God around here, right? Um, well, last week, we landed on a summary statement where Paul says, God does not show favoritism. Relative to his judgment, everybody will face judgment. Everybody. Jews and Gentiles, Adventists and atheists, Muslims and Hindus, nobody escapes the judgment of God. God will judge in the words of the old Armour hot dog commercial. Any of you remember that? God will judge fat kids, skinny kids, kids who climb on rocks, tough kids, sissy kids, even kids with... You, you are old. You do remember. Yes, everybody will face the judgment of God. Now we continue. Paul anticipates objections from both the Jews and the Gentiles. From the Jews, he expects to hear, now wait a minute, Paul. Are you telling us that our obsession with keeping the law, our desire to do what God wants us to do, that that doesn't count for anything? Then why would we even keep the law? He also anticipates objections from the Gentiles who are probably going to say, now hold on, Paul. How is it that you can judge us according to laws that we don't even know about them? Hey, that doesn't sound like a fair, impartial judge to me. If we are going to have to face judgment based on how we keep the laws that we don't even know these laws, they're Jewish laws. So, Paul helps to answer these potential objections. He goes on now, Romans chapter 2, if you have your Bible or the outline there, you can follow along. Now, we're going to slog through some fairly theologically thick stuff here. And so to make it as easy as I know how, divided the passage into three basic paragraphs. And then you will notice on the study guide that I've put a summary statement for each paragraph. This first paragraph, Paul is speaking to the Gentiles. And in essence, all he is saying is, look, the Gentiles, you're all guilty, and you all need the gospel. All right, so now let's go through it. Verse 12, all who sin apart from the law, that's the Gentiles, will also perish apart from the law. 
And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. So there he's referring, of course, to the Jews. Now, back to the Gentiles. He says, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. You think of the words of James here, chapter 1, verse 22, where James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Here, Paul is saying, don't just listen to the law, but you actually have to do what the law says. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. So, what Paul's saying here is to the Gentiles, look, I know you don't have the law, but there are times when you inadvertently keep the Jewish laws. In other words, there is this innate sense in all of us of right and wrong. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. And that's really what Paul's driving at here, is to have the law written on our hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. So there are times that you see in the lives of the Gentiles and the pagans that they have this moral compass. They, they, at some level, they, they understand between good and bad. It was Mark Twain who observed, man is the only animal that blushes. Have you ever thought of that? Man, the only animal that blushes and the only animal that needs to. We are ashamed of things we've done. Instead of being able to look God in the face or even to look one another in the face, we want to run away and hide when our conscience troubles us. We blush, we feel shame, because at some level, we all have a conscience, and we know when we do right and wrong. So Paul, referring to the Gentiles, he says, look, they blush. They're human. They have a conscience. They have some moral bearings. Then he says, this will take place on the day when God judges people's secret thoughts. And now we're all in trouble because God will someday judge our secret thoughts and our only hope, Paul says, you notice, is through Christ as my gospel declares. So to sum up the first paragraph, Paul's simply saying, you Gentiles, <laughs> you're all guilty. And you're all going to be destroyed on that day of judgment, or at least you deserve to be destroyed, but for the gospel. So we all need the gospel. And now he turns his attention to the Jews. And a summary statement here would simply be the Jews are all guilty, and they too need the gospel. Look at verse 17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, so Paul says to the Jewish community, look, you're proud that you have the law, and you in fact even teach people of the law. And you 
keep the law to some degree, but Paul warns, you better be careful here. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You teach the law. You are so proud that you have the law. Yet how often do you break the very law you teach? And then he gets real specific and mentions different sins, stealing, adultery, idolatry. How many of you Jews, Paul wonders, have not done these things? You're all guilty. Old story. We were sitting around one Saturday night, nothing to do all night to do it, when someone suggested, let's play spin the bottle. Any of you remember that game from your childhood? Uh, now, the way we used to play when we were young kids, you'd spin the bottle. The girl then had the option. She could either kiss you a peck on the cheek or pay you a nickel. So by the time I was 13, I owned my own house. Um, <laughs> that I purchased with nickels. Uh, but on this particular Saturday night, we had to change up the rules because we were all adults. So we said, here's how it's going to go down. We'll ask a leading question, then spin the bottle. Whoever it points to has to honestly answer the question. Now, I thought it'd be great fun if we just played a round or two of spin the bottle together here in church. Are you game? Now. It's only fun if everybody plays honestly, all right? So I'll ask some of the same questions we asked that night, and you just raise your hand nice and high, and I'm going to keep score. Sound good? You're really into this, aren't you? All right, the first question we asked, have you ever cheated in school? All right, so yeah, just raise your hand nice and high. Students at Spring Valley, just keep them up so the teachers can <laughs> get down your names. Okay, you did very well. I'm going to give you about a, I'm going to say 65% on that one. Pretty good. Have you ever told a lie? All right, everybody except those two in the back. And I know they're lying. Uh, so I'm giving you 100% on that. You think about it. Have you ever checked that box when you're downloading software that says, I have read? <laughs> oh, that's a lie. Yes, that is in fact a lie. Right. Okay, so we're all in trouble on that one. All right. Have you ever stolen anything? Now, come on, have you ever been at 7-Eleven, filled your big gulp, taken a few sips, and refilled it? That's stealing. All right, good, very good. Have you ever cursed, said a naughty word? Come on, like, you're all Cleveland Brown fans, of course you have cursed. <laughs> right? Have you ever had a lustful thought? Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. Just, <laughs> how about this? Let's just wink. And I'm figuring half of you are guys, so I know it's at least 50% on that one. Uh, well, this is the game that Paul's playing with the Jews. He kind of goes through a list and says, no, wait a minute. You're, you're teaching about uh, idolatry. But come on, have you never held anything in higher esteem than God? 
He's saying to the Jews, you have your laws, and you strive to keep your laws. That's good and well, but have you never broken the very laws that you are teaching the pagans to keep? Now, the bottom line is here, look, we're all guilty, and we all desperately need the gospel. And now he broadens it in the final paragraph of this passage to say just that. We all need the gospel written upon our hearts. See, this is a heart thing. It's not just about behaving in a certain way or keeping certain rules. When you talk about adultery, you know, Jesus expands the law to include even lustful thoughts. You have violated his perfect law. And so when you think about it like that, folks, we're all in trouble on the day of judgment because we are all guilty and we all need the gospel. Notice what he says, verse 25. Circumcision, and so now he's talking about a specific law and Jewish practice. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? See, what Paul's doing here now is he's mixing and matching the pagans and the Jews and certain laws and not keeping the law's behaviors. And in essence, he's saying, look, whether you're a circumcised Jew who does not obey the law or you are an uncircumcised Gentile who, in some ways, keeps the law, everyone is still going to be condemned on the day of judgment. Nobody is good enough to stand before a righteous and holy God on that day. Nobody, no matter how good you have been. We're all in trouble on the day of judgment. And to think otherwise is just preposterous. Think of it like this. Imagine three swimmers, all with the dream of getting their name in print in the Guinness Book of World Records. So all three swimmers decide I want to set the world record. I'm going to swim from Los Angeles to Sydney, Australia. The first swimmer has never been in the water before. So he gets about 20 yards before he's in trouble and he dies. The next swimmer is WSI certified, water safety instructor. In other words, he actually teaches people how to be lifeguards, a very strong swimmer. So he sets out with his eyes toward Australia. He does well. He swims five, six, seven miles he gets. And then out of pure exhaustion, he goes under and is buried at sea. The final swimmer, is a world record holder, has many, many gold medals in his collection, one of the best swimmers in the world. He sets out, swims past where the first person drowned and the second person drowned. He's still swimming strong, but he does not even make it to Hawaii, which isn't even a third of the way to Australia before he drowns. None of them, no matter how great they might be at swimming, none of them 
have even a remote possibility of swimming that distance. And that, in effect, is what Paul is telling all of us, whether you're Jews and Gentiles, whether you are circumcised or not, whether you keep the law or you don't keep the law, it doesn't matter. No matter how good you are, God will judge us by our hearts, which are all polluted. So nobody stands a chance on the final day of judgment except for the righteousness of Christ, except for the gospel. That's the only hope anybody has. And so Paul then concludes this passage by saying, the one who is not circumcised physically, that is the Gentile, and yet obeys the law, will condemn you who even though you, that's the Jews, have the written code and circumcision, are lawbreakers. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No. A person who is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. It all comes back to the heart. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So you need a heart change, and that only comes from God. So we'll pick it up from here next week as we continue through the book of Romans. I'll leave you with a parable that actually was uh, one of the very first articles I ever got published in a legit magazine. And I based that parable on this very passage in Romans chapter 2. So I'll just leave you with this. I felt like a rag doll, whoa, in the dryer's spin cycle. Desperate to feel better, I made an appointment with Dr. Law. It's your heart, Dr. Law growled with the compassion of a bulldog. My heart, I questioned. There's no trace of heart trouble in my family. Aren't you going to examine me? No diagnosis necessary, he said. It's your heart. But my heart's never given me problems. It's got to be my feet. Check out my feet. My, they take me to liquor stores and nightclubs. And it's your heart. Oh, well, at least check my hands. These hands have rolled dice and filled mugs with beers and played cars. And Here's the problem. Check out my hands. It's your heart. Well, at least examine my ears. I mean, I've listened to a lot of dirty jokes and gossip and profanity and enough rock and roll to kill the Rolling Stones. It's your heart. Well, there's plenty of other good doctors in this town. I stormed out of the office like a stuntman from a cannon. For the next 10 months, I bounced from doctor to doctor, faithfully performing every prescription, yet never feeling healthy. Dr. Religion prescribed a regimen of baptism, church attendance, and tithing. Dr. Diet blamed my eating habits and suggested a menu of tofu, tree bark, and fry chick. Dr. B. Good stripped my rings and bracelet and helped me to stop going to movies. While every doctor promised a cure, Nothing could quiet the gnawing emptiness that ached within. In despair, I returned to Dr. Law. It's your heart, his first words, yeah. But what do I do? Oh, <laughs> you need a heart transplant, of course. Oh, okay. Glad it's nothing serious. 
Well, it's heart transplant or death. His words cut like a scalpel. Okay, I'll let you do the operation. Oh, no, I don't opt or operate, said Dr. Law. That's why I have a partner. Come, follow me. He led me across the hall to Dr. Grace's office. You ready for the operation, Dr. Grace asked me kindly. Well, I, uh, relax. I've never lost a case. Okay, but just please. I'm a wimp. Give me a double dose of the anesthetic. Oh, no. Uh, I don't use anesthetic. You need to stay awake for this. Even my toenails sweat as he made the first incision. Suddenly, the odor of pure manure filled the room. I grabbed a pillow to breathe through. What is that disgusting smell? Oh, it's your heart. My heart? Yes. You, you can smell all of the dirty jokes and the gossip and the lust. All of it's collected right here in your heart. I guess I really do need a heart. By the way, what does a heart cost anyways? I haven't seen any good heart sales lately. $26 trillion, he said without looking up. At $50 a month, how long will it take me to pay for it? Oh, <laughs> he laughed. You'll never pay for it. A friend has taken care of it for you. Making his final stitch, Dr. Grace looked up there. How's that feel? Well, I said, I, I feel better already. Oh, you'll feel even better with exercise. Exercise? Oh, yes, of course. Dr. Law and I are both firm believers in exercise. You mean like all of the other doctors prescribed? Well, in a sense, exercise is critical, but only after you have addressed the heart of the matter, which of course is a matter of the heart. My mind swirled. Um, about that friend, you know, who paid for my new heart, could I meet him? Most certainly, Dr. Grace said, he would like that very much. But just so you know, be prepared. In order to give you a new heart, his was crushed. So don't be surprised by the ugly, gaping scar in his side. Yeah. 
precious day that grace appeared the hour I first believed when we've been there ten thousand Take Church Home. Here's the whole teaching in a tweet. You didn't even need to listen through the whole sermon. You'd get it right here. On the day of judgment, all of your good deeds won't help you. All of your misdeeds won't hurt you. The only thing that will matter is this. Have you asked Jesus to stand in your place? Father, help us now by your Holy Spirit to go and to live and to love like Jesus. Amen.